forgive me. Uh, first up, we're going we're gonna to have Hal Singer, who is the managing director and principal at Navigant e Econo Economics. He's a, also an adjunct professor at Georgetown University's McDonough School of Business. Um, his areas of expertise, obviously, are antitrust, finance regulation. He's written, read, written many books and textbooks on this particular subject. Um, Hal has earned an MA and a PhD, so he is actually Dr. Singer um, from Johns Hopkins U University and a BS magna cum laude from economics from Tulane University. And Hal's going to give us uh, maybe 10 minutes on, on his perspectives on, on competition in the mobile marketplace. And we're welcome to have uh, uh, a few minutes of Q&A with Hal, the same way for our next speaker, who I'll introduce in just a second. Hal? Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for having me here. I, um, I usually like to begin a speech with a joke, but I'm, I, I'm going to reserve the joke to the end and see how this audience is doing. Um, I just want to make uh, two very simple points today and uh, see if I can get you to buy into these. The first one is that the wireless market uh, is effectively uh, competitively supplied, which is the same opinion that the FCC had at least in six prior FCC, uh, six prior wireless competition reports up until the uh, 14th. And I also want to make another point, which is that um, the market structure does not seem to matter much uh, in the wireless industry when it comes to predicting prices. So let's, let's start with the first one, and then we'll, uh, we'll move to the second. Um, wireless market is, is, is competitively supplied. What kind of evidence do I want to look at as an economist to make this determination? Well, there's been a movement uh, in the field uh, over the last uh, 15, 20 years um, to, to put more weight on what is called the direct evidence. Uh, and direct evidence, um, kind of as the, as the name suggests, is just look directly at the data. What is it telling you? Um, as opposed to trying to make inferences based on some kind of indirect evidence. Um, the, uh, an expression that I like to, I like to use uh, when we're in an antitrust case is, um, you know, does it, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, then maybe it is a duck. So the question is, what, is it, what does a monopolist do? How does a firm that is monopolized behave, right? Well, monopolists like to raise prices, right? What else do they do? They also like to exclude entrance. So what economists and the courts and, and now the antitrust agencies, if you read uh, the, re the revision to the merger guidelines in, in 2010, they're putting this emphasis on direct evidence. And what does the direct evidence tell us uh, in the wireless space? Let's start off with, with prices. Well, let's start off with voice prices. What we, I hope, all can agree on, uh, and it's a great thing, is that uh, voice prices have been falling over time. Um, I like to use the BLS data. Other people cite data from the GAO. It really doesn't matter. But BLS keeps a, uh, a basket of wireless services over time and tracks it over time. And just since um, over the last decade, the same basket of wireless services has fallen by about 12%, according to the BLS. And since about 1997, that same basket has fallen by about 14, up by about 40%. And this is a wonderful thing for consumers. Um, if you don't like... Uh, uh, indices, uh, look at ARPUs, the average revenue per unit. Um, uh, the, I think a nice source for the, of this is the Bank of America Merrill Lynch study that compares uh, ARPU in the U.S. Uh, against ARPU for a host of other, of other countries in a survey. And it found something rather remarkable, which is that the ARPU, the average revenue per user for, for voice in the U.S., is lower than in any other country in the world in its survey. It's down to four cents a minute now. Um, it's very impressive, and this is a wonderful thing uh, for consumers. And some people say, well, okay, maybe that's true for voice, but it's not true for data. Well, uh, the Nielsen study just came out on what's happening with data prices, and let me tell you what they found. Um, data prices are falling. Uh, when it comes to um, text messaging, if you, if you look at the price per text message, it's declined from six cents to one cent from 2005 to 2010. If you look at the price per megabit downloaded, uh, it's fallen 90% um, from 47 cents per megabyte down, megabit down to, to 5 cents uh, over the same, oh, since 2008. Uh, and finally, the FCC report itself, uh, if, you, if you can kind of skip over the executive summary uh, and actually look at the data that's in the report and the body of the report, the FCC documents, uh, according to my count, eight effective price decreases that occurred during the window uh, for which it studied from 2008 to 2009. Um, you know, uh, one firm, it was Leap and, and Metro PCS in particular, kind of setting off a price war and Verizon and AT&T having to, having to reduce their prices uh, significantly as a result. Okay, well, if, if prices are falling, um, 
Uh, what's the next dimension of direct evidence? And that's entry. Are we seeing incumbents doing things to, to thwart entry? Do we, do we not see entry? Well, again, I'm going to start looking at uh, the FCC's 14th report. And they, they considered entry by Clearwire, Leap, and Metro PCS, just in this little two-year window that they're looking at, to be economically significant. This is the FCC itself. Leap and Metro PCS collectively serve 21 out of the 25 largest uh, economic areas in the United States, which is creating effectively a fifth national provider um, for, for almost all U.S. consumers. Um, J.P. Morgan Equity Research said that um, the wireless industry is one of, uh, remains one of high and aggressive competition. Um, and they noted that Clearwire and Light Squared represented two entrants uh, that are special because of their cost structure. Their co they think their cost structure is actually lower than the cost structure of what's achieved by the, by the incumbent carriers. And as a result, that excess capacity that's coming onto the market um, given a lower cost structure, should put even more downward pressure on prices. Finally, regional carriers like U.S. Cellular, Cellular South, and the, and the resellers impose even further price discipline on the incumbent carriers. Now, I was at a, um, at a seminar last week at George Mason, and I, and I heard, uh, Adam will, will remember this, I heard uh, uh, this notion for the first time that, okay, Hal, may, maybe the markets are competitive and they're working, but they're only working for people who take big bundles. Right? But, but the, the guy who's really not getting served is the guy who just wants to, he doesn't like buffets. That was the quote that was used. It's the guy who just likes the little package. And if you, and if you focus on that segment of the market, that's where the real market failure uh, is occurring. And I asked him, without naming any names, do you have any evidence of this? And he said, no, 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 but I'm, just, I'm watching the packages over time. They seem to be growing over time. And, and, um, and he said it would be helpful if there was a little Santa's helper um, that would go out and kind of do shopping for us all and comparing price and, and data and, and minutes. And, I, and I've actually got this. I was going to put it up there, but I was, I was told I couldn't use any exhibits today. If anybody wants to write, I'll send you my little Santa's helper uh, in Washington, D.C. But, but this is what I found. I was looking for prices um, below, say, $40 a month. I thought that was a, a reasonable uh, cutoff for, for what's expensive or what's not. And I found that just in the D.C. area alone that there are 10 unique plans uh, under $40 a month that are offered by five unique carriers, okay? I, I also was, was looking to see if, um, you know, where T-Mobile kind of sat in the spectrum of kind of the low price. And, uh, and, and precisely as, uh, as the merger filings uh, suggested by the, by the various um, declarations, uh, T-Mobile has been badly undercut by Leap and Metro PCS. Here, unfortunately, we don't have Metro PCS, but, but we can look at Leap's price. Leap offers for $35 a month in Washington an unlimited voice and text plan. And I was trying to find the closest T-Mobile plan because everyone holds T-Mobile out as being the low end. It turns out that T-Mobile's um, closest plan to that is a 500-minute plan, not, a, not an unlimited plan, and it doesn't even include text, and it costs an additional $5 uh, per month. So I, I would suggest to you that there is competition, even for the segment of the, of the market who does not like the buffet and wants their, wants their, uh, their, their bits and, or their wireless plans in small bite-sized pieces. Second um, point I wanted to make today was this notion of um, market structure. I mean, does it matter? There are a lot of statistics being, being thrown around town these days uh, concerning the um, the, the uh, AT&T T-Mobile merger, you probably keep hearing a statistic uh, thrown around of 80 percent. I think the USA Today uh, ran with an op-ed saying that if we allow this merger to go through, something like 80 percent will be concentrated in, in the hands of two carriers. And, and what's, um, uh, besides the fact that 80 percent isn't the right number, the, the, the sum of the three carriers, AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile actually comes out to something in the low 70s. If you just set that aside, you have, have to ask yourself, you know, is, is Verizon part of the deal? I, I wasn't aware of that. Uh, and if they're not, you know, why are we adding in Verizon share? It turns out that AT&T and T-Mobile combined are a little over 40 percent, which in most antitrust courts in the U.S., it, it changes as you move across the circuits, wouldn't, any, it wouldn't be anywhere close to what's considered to be uh, monopoly levels. Now, let me, let me talk to you uh, just very briefly about um, the, the secret kind of assumption or presumption that's being made whenever you cite market share in, 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 in an argument, right? What, you're, what you are presuming is that market shares or concentration 
indices, which is just kind of a summary statistic of everybody's market share, is a good predictor of prices. Okay, that's what you're doing, whether you know it or not. Um, and and I will grant to you that in certain industries, concentration can, as a theoretical matter, can serve as a good predictor of prices. When? Well, you just have to go to the literature and see how these models, uh, uh, what, what assumptions these models rely on. And here are the key assumptions. Number one is that the products at issue are homogeneous. That is, they're, they're commodity-like, they're fungible, right? The second key assumption of these models that relate price-cost margins to industry concentration is that the market is static. That is, today's product is the same as yesterday's product, is the same as the product four years ago, right? And, and what, what these, there's nothing wrong with the models, right? They didn't make a mistake in the models. Um, but but the, the models, like any models, hinge on, on key assumptions. And when those assumptions are violated, then the models don't do a good job in predicting the direction of prices. Okay, so, so what, what's an industry that would satisfy these assumptions? Well, I'm thinking things like pork bellies or, or retail gasoline, right? You've got this, everybody selling the same stuff, and the stuff today is no different than the stuff from two days ago or a year ago or five years ago. But in wireless, okay, we violate these assumptions badly, right? Firms don't compete just on prices in wireless. They compete on, on how many minutes are included, whether or not a data plan is included, whether or not other, other exciting options are, are included. They compete on, on the quality of the handsets. They compete on the quality of the network. Economists call this type of competition differentiated products competition, right? And that alone would be enough to upset the assumption that's needed for there to be a relationship between concentration and prices. But what about the second one? What about dynamic? Is this a dynamic industry? Well, of course it is. The products that are being offered today look nothing like the products that were just offered a few years ago. You know, who could have, who could have even envisioned just a few years ago that apps uh, would be the key element that a, that a customer would look at in determining, you know, which phone he'd want or which carrier he'd want to go to, okay? So, well, that's the theory, okay? But if you don't, if you don't buy into the theory, let's actually look at the data. Okay. One thing that uh, the FCC's report noted was that over the last seven years, concentration, uh, uh, as measured by the HHI, has increased in the wireless industry from about 2,100 to 2,800, which is a, a big increase, no doubt, 700-point 700, 700 increase in concentration, right? But what's been happen happening to prices over that same time period? Right? Prices have been falling. So we have this very strange relationship here where concentration is rising, right? But at the same time, prices continue to fall, right? Uh, which is in uh, complete violation of the whole structure conduct paradigm. Structure conduct paradigm would predict the opposite. That is that, that the more concentration you have, the prices would be higher, but we're actually getting the opposite relationship, all right? Now, if you don't like that example, let me give you a new one that's about to come out in a paper that I'm co-authoring with a uh, with Jerry Fallhaber of, of, of University of Pennsylvania, former FCC chief economist. He said, let's look, let's take advantage of the change in the HHI as you move across the country at a given point in time. You know, if you go into the FCC's 14th report, they computed the HHI, and I've been basically throwing that around, I apologize, assuming uh, we all were antitrust scholars, but this is just an index that, that, that captures um, everyone's market share in a given market and reduces it down to one summary statistic, okay? And um, the FCC was nice enough to give us uh, its measure of HHI for about 175 local markets in the country in 2008, okay? And they vary widely. It's not the case that everybody in, uh, has, is facing the same number of competitors all over the country. It's not the case that, uh, that, that Verizon has the same share in Chicago as it does in San Francisco. These HHIs vary widely as you move across the country. And what was a very interesting question for us is, okay, well, would that help us explain the variation in prices across the country? And we have a database of over, uh, from TNS Telecoms, it's a firm that, that actually buys your phone bill and then records everything that's on the phone bill uh, electronically. And what we're allowed to, what we're able to do as economists is to see if we can correlate or predict the changes in prices as we move across all these phone bills, thousands and thousands of phone bills, knowing where the subscriber lives, with knowledge of what the HHI is in the market in which that subscriber lives. 
Uh, and guess what? I mean, after you control for all the other things that should explain the variations in the prices, concentration has no predictive power, okay? Which, is, again, flies uh, completely in the face of this presumption of the structure conduct paradigm. So the next time that someone uh, tells you, you know, market shares are this and they're changing that, you, you know, you should ask them, do market shares do a good job in predicting prices? Because at the end of the day, that's all we're trying to do. We just want to predict prices, okay? And I'll just finish with this, and this is my joke. It's kind of lame, but we'll see if I get any laughs with it. I was thinking of an analogy, you know, which is my daughters asked me in the morning, you know, Dad, what's the, what's the temperature going to be today? You know, should I wear my jacket or can I wear shorts? I usually go to my app on my iPhone. I actually go to the weather and I see what, what the temperature is going to be. But, you know, um, there's, there, there are easy ways to get direct reads on what the temperature is going to be. You can, you can open up the door and step outside, okay? You can also look out the window, right? These are direct measures of what's going to happen to the weather. Right? An alternative, indirect approach would be to, to see how my knees are feeling, right? Because sometimes my knees feel bad. Anyway, that was my joke. I could also ask the dog, you know, what, what, what my dog thinks the, uh, the weather's going to be. And so the, 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 the conclusion here is that if you want to know what's happening with wireless prices, look at them, okay? And if they're going down, that tells you something. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thanks very much. So I, I've been preparing for this all day. Uh, as, as Hal, everybody knows um, Andrew J. Schwartzman, uh, who is the policy director, senior vice president for Media Access Project. Um, he's been policy director since 1978, so he's been doing this stuff for, for quite a while. Um, he is also a faculty member at John Ho Johns Hopkins University School of Arts and Sciences, where he teaches communications and contemporary society programs. So welcome, Andrew J. Schwartzman. Okay, uh, I'm not an economist, uh, nor do I play one on TV um, uh, or here. Uh, I'm ill-equipped uh, to address in any kind of detail the kind of presentation that, that Hal has just made, but I can make a few observations, and then I'm going to devote the bulk of my remarks to, uh, uh, to the pending ATT T-Mobile merger. Uh, because uh, this really is the current and the future of wireless competition in this country. The merger, if approved, will, by any standard, remake the competitive environment for wireless in this country. So it is, it is not just the topic du jour, it's, it's really the future of wireless in this country. Uh, the presentation you've just heard basically says pay no attention to the traditional antitrust and economic analyses because they don't matter. Uh, and um, I can show you that they don't matter uh, and therefore everything that you've ever heard or learned about competitive analysis uh, doesn't matter. And that's because if you do the traditional analysis, if you apply, in the case of ATT T-Mobile, the uh, Justice Department's merger guidelines uh, to the transaction, uh, you find that this is not a competitive marketplace. Uh, Hal has told you that essentially the only thing that really matters is price. But we're future oriented and we look at innovation. We look at opportunities for entry. Uh, and that is where the evidence of the anti competitive nature of the current wireless marketplace comes up. Uh, yes, voice prices are down somewhat. My data has uh, data ARPU's avenue reven average revenue per user going up. And we also have caps.
being put on data use, which whether you want to view that as a price increase or a service decrease uh, is not only uh, uh, significant at a time when costs are going down, uh, but it's also running counter to the worldwide trend. Data prices in this country run roughly 30 percent higher than they run in Western Europe, where there is a, a much more competitive environment and they have uh, uh, wholesale markets. Text messaging, yes, the price of text messaging has gone down. But it is still so far above cost, the incremental cost of a text message is, is a fraction of a cent and essentially ought to be given away free with voice service in a truly competitive market. The prices that Hal was talking about are calculated based on an assumption, I believe, Everyone is using all the minutes in their bucket. You get a thousand minutes, you pay a hundred dollars, ten cents a minute. Uh, did I do my math right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's also comparing apples to oranges uh, with respect to the niche players, the new entrants, Leap, and uh, Metro PCS are niche players focusing on the bottom end of the market. They are not national. They are, they are of no use if you travel internationally. Uh, they are uh, limited uh, uh, largely to the CDMA technology, uh, which means that we're looking at a increasing anti-competitive environment in the GSM technology, which is the international technology. Uh, this is especially important when it comes, as I've said, to innovation. The small players are unable to get the exclusives or even get access to the high-end handsets. There's a reason that the iPod was offered to Verizon and Sprint and T-Mobile and AT&T and then exclusively offered to AT&T and not offered to the small entrants. They're never going to be meaningful competitors. They are simply going to be uh, yapping at the, uh, at the cuffs of the big players. Now, we can argue whether it's 70 percent or 80 percent. Uh, uh, combined market share after the transaction, but that's how you look at a transaction. We are going to have two companies sharing 70 percent or 80 percent of the market with a third national player with 14 or thereabouts, depending on your numbers, and then these local and regional bit players who offer whose emphasis is on prepaid services. By traditional antitrust standards, the HHI, which is already, depending on your number, 2600 or 2800, which is already a suspicious number, a highly concentrated number, goes up about 700 points. 100 points is sufficient to uh, generate heightened scrutiny. There is therefore a strong presumption that the ATT T Mobile deal uh, is uh, anti competitive. If you drill down, it gets even worse because not only is this a four to three in terms of national players, but T Mobile is the maverick firm. In the antitrust law, we look very hard at the role of mavericks, innovative players, even small ones. Acquisition of a maverick is given a disproportionate emphasis in antitrust law. 
and for good reason. In this transaction, it is T-Mobile that has ads attacking AT&T by name. T-Mobile introduced the Android phone. T-Mobile's sidekick was a breakthrough in handsets. It also took on the Nexus phone unsuccessfully, but it took that risk, and that's the important thing from a standpoint of innovation and competition. Among the national services, it is a price leader, 15 to $50 a month less than AT&T's for similar plans, according to Consumers Union. It has much more aggressive marketing plans. It gave away every phone it had free for two days earlier this year. The transaction also needs to be looked at in terms of other aspects that can permit exclusionary conduct. The backhaul market, AT&T and Verizon control the connections that get from the cell phone towers to the internet. And if T-Mobile is removed, this leaves Sprint in a desperate situation. Uh, data roaming, again, uh, uh, the smaller players are dependent on AT&T and Verizon to offer national plans. These aren't regional markets. These are national markets. Nobody buys a local calling plan. Everybody buys national calling plans. The supposed efficiencies that come from the transaction are for the most part not merger specific. Uh, and I would note that efficiencies uh, almost never justify a merger to near monopoly, which is what, what we're talking about here. We're not creating new spectrum. T-Mobile and AT&T largely overlap. Uh, if AT&T spent part of the $39 billion that it's spending to purchase T-Mobile, to upgrade its network and use it more efficiently, we would have a much more competitive environment and acceleration of 4G introduction. AT&T is sitting on spectrum, huge swaths of spectrum, which it acquired in the C-block auction. The uh, the competitors that are being offered up here, Clearwire, which is barely off of the ground, which uses an inferior technology and is uh, not capable of offering a true retail service on a national basis, it's really a wholesaler, and, Clear uh, and Light Squared, which I'm very enthusiastic about the possibility that Light Squared can offer some genuine competition. Uh, I, I don't know how people, how familiar people are with light, light squared, but it's using spectrum. It wants to use spectrum that that has been limited to satellite use for now. It's very relatively high up spectrum, and there are immense technological, legal, and financial problems. It is unclear if light squared will ever get off of the ground. I, again, I hope it does, but it's unclear it will. Uh, it's doesn't have a single base station up except in Las Vegas where they're doing a little test. Uh, uh, it, uh, it is years away before it can even enter the market, and the market it would be entering will be a market dominated by this duopoly. Uh, so the competitive environment is bad according to my take, and the AT&T T-Mobile transaction threatens to make it worse. I would make two other points very briefly. Number one, this is not just a Department of Justice 
Clayton Act antitrust case. This is also an FCC case. And to justify, unlike other markets, to justify a transaction under the Communications Act, Congress has required for good reason that the applicants not just demonstrate that it isn't going to be bad, they have to demonstrate that it is affirmatively in the public interest. That is, we will be better off if AT&T acquires T-Mobile. That is a very stiff burden at the FCC, and so far their justifications uh, have fallen very far short of what would be necessary to justify it. The second point I would make is I have to concede that there is one pro-competitive aspect of the AT&T T-Mobile transaction, and that is if the Department of Justice or the FCC blocks the AT&T T-Mobile transaction, AT&T has to pay T-Mobile a $3 billion breakup fee, and it, ha and it has to provide data roaming at discounted prices for 10 years. And that would be very pro-competitive. So I have to concede that one pro-competitive aspect of the transaction, but generally speaking, uh, I think it's going to make what is a bad situation worse. Thank you. Well, I, I thought we would um, allow for just a, a couple of questions from the audience. If uh, I have a wireless microphone here, so don't be shy. And, and, and Hal, I think Hal has some uh, response questions. I, I just, um, just my, if, if I could, um, I don't know, if I could speak maybe for a minute or two on the, on the transaction, I, 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 um, I was under the impression that we were to talk about wireless competition generally, but I'm, I'd be happy to, to, to respond to some of that if, if that's okay. Sure, yeah. um, I, <clears throat> I, I think what's um, the most in, important issue to, to, um, uh, that's facing the, anti, uh, the DOJ and the FCC in, uh, in assessing the competitive impact of this transaction is the degree to which T-Mobile uh, constrains the price of AT&T and vice versa. In other words, how close are, are these products uh, in, in product space? Are they close economic substitutes? Uh, if anyone um, goes back and reads the DOJ's uh, competitive impact statement in um, XM Sirius, uh, in, there you arguably have a merger that was two to one uh, under certain market definitions. The, the most important question on their mind was, does Sirius constrain the price of XM and vice versa? And if not, we have to let this merger go through. Now, now you might, might not agree with that, um, with that decision or that framework, but that, that is the framework. That, that is the stuff that you know, gets the economists up in the morning. And when you, I, I, I chuckled when I heard uh, Andrew uh, refer to um, T-Mobile as a maverick. Um, T-Mobile, uh, <laughs> someone's stomach just growled. Um, T-Mobile T, T is the only carrier of the top, um, you know, five or six national carriers, and I, of course, include Leap and Metro PCS, who was losing customers in 2010, right? They have the highest churn in the industry among these uh, national carriers. And, uh, and, and so for, for one to try to find price disciplining power from a person who is uniquely losing customers is going to be very hard to do empirically. The second thing I want to say is this notion, the Maverick, I, I like the word Maverick as my basketball team's the Mavericks, and we're going to the finals now. But the the, the second thing I would I would suggest is, if if they're the uh, if they're the lowest price in town, you should look at the T-Mobile filing, not the AT&T filing, but the T-Mobile filing uh, in in the merger transaction. Uh, and the quote uh, from the CEO, and I'm going to paraphrase it, goes something like this: We were trying to hold ourselves out as the low-priced package in town, and we were badly undercut by Leap and Metro PCS. That is the reason why Leap and Metro PCS are gaining, why we are losing. And we were, and I'm paraphrasing, we were kind of trapped in the middle of the road. We're trying to hold ourselves out as the low end, but we got undercut. And then AT&T, uh, Verizon, and, and Sprint are kind of perceived as being the high end. Uh, and so we ended up with nothing, and that's that's why we're withering on the vine. So when, when Andrew said, um, it's, a, it's a maverick firm, I, I got a good kick out of that. Uh, 
I will just do one second. Uh, just I wish I, I wish you knew this was kind of just this morning. I uh, found a quote from a, a case in the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, which addressed precisely the point, which is why I'm taking the opportunity to say one more thing. Uh, uh, in a maverick transaction, a transaction involving a maverick, it doesn't matter if the maverick does not succeed and does not exercise pricing power. Its influence on the market is nonetheless considered to be important. So just on that point, I just happened to run across uh, a, a, a quote this morning, so I just wanted to address that. Thanks. Okay, um, well, I, I want to thank uh, both of you gentlemen for uh, pr the perspectives. Uh, we have Congressman Lada. On, oh, we have a question in the audience. One, one, one more question. In, in looking at the number of players, what factor or what relevance is it, the fact that that fourth player was um, looking to – be sold anyway, and that they were putting themselves on the market because of the problem. So it's not as if there's some sort of hostile takeover or something. So this fourth player potentially could go away anyway, whether it goes into the first, second, or third player. But they were on their way out, potentially. There were other people trying to buy them that didn't work out. So really, at and is sort of the third actor that has come along to now try to take up this company that's withering and saying we want to be sold, we may want out of this market anyway. You want to go first? Um, it's sure. It, it's certainly a relevant factor, um, uh, and it dovetails nicely with this point that I was trying to make, which is was was T-Mobile imposing any price discipline? Were, were they acting as a constraint uh, on 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 AT and T's or Verizon's or Sprint's ability to raise prices? The answer is no. They were they were withering on the vine. They had the highest churn. They were having a horrible 2010. They were the only ones losing customers. Everyone else was gaining. So yes, you you have to you have to take that into consideration because this but for world is what would what would happen in the absence of this transaction, and if in the absence of this transaction. Um, the firm just kind of is slowly bled bled out by by their corporate headquarters in Germany over the next year. I mean that that's no good for anyone. And the upside here is that AT and T's technology is compatible with T-Mobile. So you have this unique uh, right. It's a unique opportunity to to create efficiencies um, in the sense that uh, Verizon or Sprint couldn't uh, couldn't exploit um, that opportunity. Well, first of all, the unique opportunity is to get essentially 100 percent monopoly on GSM uh, technology in the United States, uh, which has profoundly negative impacts on the technological innovation that I was talking about. Uh, the question that the Justice Department and the FCC has, have to look at is not, uh, well, they were going to sell anyway, so they might as well sell to AT&T. It's whether this transaction violates the law and this transaction is in the public interest. The fact is that even if you want to assume that T-Mobile was going to be sold, uh, uh, there are numerous other buyers there, including new entrants into the market, most particularly the cable operators and, uh, uh, and EchoStar, which have acquired large portions, large chunks of spectrum in the recent auctions and need wireless business plans and uh, you had other buyers who could create a more competitive environment rather than the anti-competitive environment that would be created from this transaction. So I'm not saying it's irrelevant, but I am saying that uh, it's not as if this were the only buyer available. Okay, well, listen, um, uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for your perspectives. Um, uh, thank you so much.